Hello, welcome back to this course on differential manifolds. Welcome to my living room. Today it's a great day to start a new chapter and this is exactly what we are going to do. It's an exciting day. Today we are going to talk about symplectic manifolds. And you wonder why should we worry about symplectic uh, manifolds? Well, the language of symplectic forms is very useful uh, to write down uh, mechanical systems, to write down the equations associated with some physical problems in celestial mechanics, etc. So that's a convenient language to address all these problems. That's from one hand. From the other hand, if we look back at what we've learned in the former years at the School of Mathematics, we've learned uh, in differential geometry, uh, we've learned Riemannian manifolds, and we've learned how to well, how to classify them, that's too much. But we've learned that there are even local invariants. We've learned that curvature, the way a manifold curves in a space, is enough to provide a local invariant. This means, in other words, that if I take two Riemannian manifolds and I take a point in each of the, these Riemannian manifolds, if the manifolds are of the same dimension, this is not a strong enough condition to guarantee that they are equivalent, not even locally, because curvature is a constraint towards this. We're going to see that uh, symplectic, if we ask the same question uh, in the realm of symplectic uh, manifolds of the symplectic geometry, we get a complete different answer. Indeed, if I get two uh, symplectic manifolds of the same dimension, they are locally equivalent. This means that there exists that if I take if I take two points in two different symplectic manifolds of the same dimension, I can always find neighborhoods small enough and a diffeomorphism between the neighborhood, neighborhood such that it takes one symplectic form to the other. This is marvelous. Indeed, this is the content of Darboux theorem. This was already known to Darboux in a way that maybe he didn't expect. Okay. So that's wonderful. So we are going to deal with some manifolds that are completely different from Riemannian manifolds. Another main difference between Riemannian and symplectic manifolds is that Riemannian manifolds are governed by, the, by a symmetric tensor, whereas uh, symplectic manifolds are governed indeed by anti-symmetric uh, uh, tensors. I could think and this is the way we are going to define them, that they are governed by a two form. This two form, in principle, cannot be any form because I want some particular equation related to Hamilton's equation to have a solution, okay? This uh, adds some requirements on this omega. So, do you want to learn more about this uh, symplectic manifolds? Stay time. See you in a while. Uh, by the way, I have to tell you that I have a small problem with, um, with my computer. Therefore, I have to really turn off uh, here the video because I'm going to use the same computer uh, to write than to film. Okay? Uh, so, well, that's life. <laughs> so, see you later. All right. Now I plan to share the screen. Okay, and uh, say uh, I want to share the screen with you, and I want to share with one note. All right. Okay. Uh, a summary of what I said. Uh, what I said is the following. Here we have Riemannian. manifolds okay i'm going to draw a line and properties of riemannian uh, manifolds is geometry governed by symmetric tensor g which we call the Riemannian structure. All right, that's a main feature. Secondly, 
and very important uh, feature is that there are local invariants. Let's explain this below. Take, I'm going to explain this with a picture. I'm going to draw for you first a sphere, which we know it has constant curvature. If I consider the sphere embedded on R3 with the standard Euclidean uh, uh, Riemannian structure, and now I take an ellipsoid, okay? And already, if, even if they are homeomorphic, diffeomorphic, whatever you want, curvature, it's an invariant for this point to be locally equivalent to this point. Okay, so the main point is that curvature provides local invariants. So an important fact And I'm going to stress that in a different color. An important fact in Riemannian geometry is that I can have two different manifolds, M1, G1, and M2, of the same dimension, G2. And uh, they are, they can be very different, of course, they can be very different, but locally, two two uh, dimensional two uh, Riemannian manifolds all of the same dimension are not necessarily equivalent, not even local. Okay, what's next? What's next is to talk, it's to fill in this second column that I have here, okay? And I'm going to change color for that. I don't know, what is a good symplectic color? Maybe purple. So here I'm going to talk about symplectic manifolds. I didn't give uh, the definition, all right? And I'm going to motivate this definition, okay? So I'm going to fill in this part here, but first I want to take motivational motivation from physics. And I'm going to talk about equations of motion of a particle under with total energy H. Okay. Okay. If I talk about equations of motion, okay, then very realistically, I am considering a cotangent model. So the, frame, uh, the framework of physics, and you may think that you start with the uh, Newton's uh, uh, second law, for instance, and you do the typical change of momentum and position. I may look for a video and exactly uh, link it there, where this is explained, otherwise you may look at your favorite book. So, but I'm going to assume that you know this, okay? So I'm going to take, I'm going to denote the P as momentum, All right, and I'm going to denote the Q as position. All right, this means that I am uh, working on the cotangent bundle of some Rn, where the coordinates Q, which I may think as Q1, Qn, lives on Rn, and the P, the momenta, are, are the dual. They are on the fibers of this cotangent bundle, okay? Now I recall some the, the, the equations of motion are called Hamilton's equations. And I'm going maybe to stress this in a different color. 
which is a good color for Hamilton's equation. Let's put them in orange. Hamilton's equations can be read of the following type. I can write my equations as Q point, partial of H, partial of P, and P point minus partial of H, partial of Q. Well, you may see this interchange, it doesn't matter. These are the equations of motion and also tot H is usually called the total energy and it's a function and it depends on T in general. This is called the total energy of the system. And that's a very physical problem. Okay, so now that I have this set up, I want to indeed give a definition of symplectic form. Okay, I could just start with the definition and there you go, but I want to motivate it slightly from these equations. So I'm going to play a little bit with these equations, all right? Well, first of all, when I put P, you understand that I have here N equations and here I have N equations with the notation that I'm, I'm not um, skipping this sub this subindex. So these are not equations in the cotangent bundle of R2, but in the cotangent bundle of any Rn, okay? So with this very notation, I'm going to take a one form. Okay, I'm going maybe to change now color and I'm going to write this in blue, what about blue? I'm going to take alpha to be PDQ, all right? Where P is the momentum and Q is the position in, in the notation that I'm using, P is momentum and Q is position. And that notation is going to be important, all right? Well, the ones that are familiar for this, if I have, you know, if, I, if I'm, this is a notation, I'm going to, uh, write this like for the sum v from 1 to n for pi dqi. That's what it means, all right? But I write this in a compact way so as to get the equations. This is a perfect one form on the cotangent bundle, all right? And this one form is, it has a, a, a name, it's called Liouville one form. Up to sign, well, some of you maybe think that the, I need a minus, there is a, a controversy with sign in the Liouville one form, Hamilton's equation. I'm going to try to fix a notation. You can change, okay, the notation if you want, but you have to do it in a consistent way. So this is the Liouville one form, all right? And I have an interesting thing going on that if I take omega, the differential of alpha and I call this omega, okay, this is a two form. So omega leaves in, um, is the two form in the cotangent bundle on the total space huh? of Rn, all right? And I can write this. This is just dp dq. If I use uh, my notation, this is just the sum from y1 to n from dpi to dqi. And this also has a famous name if this one form is called Liouville, this is called Darwin. And maybe I should just stress this in a different color. This is Darbu. This is Darbu form. And Liouville one form is this one. So we have two famous guys that are going to be relevant for our computations. Okay, my game now, I'm going to play the following game play game, play game here is solve equation. Don't get overexcited with this. My game is to solve uh, an equation and the equation is the following. Omega is a two form, okay? H is a function, so I may consider minus the differential of H. For simplification now, well, I may consider that this H depends on T, but I take the, the total differential, what physics is called total differential. This is the differential only in the P's and the Q's, all right? And I wanna solve the differential equation, uh, this differential, this equation here. Okay, 
it's convenient maybe now to use some colors, different colors to stress data and what we want to find. And let me put this in pink. This is the data that I have. So the data is, I have an energy, that's H, and I take the differential of energy. And that's a perfect one form. It's so perfect that it's exact. It's the differential of a function, okay? So minus differential of H belongs to omega one of the cotangent bundle of Rm, all right? That's what I get. And well, omega is also a data because this is the, the form that I have. This is the Darbu form, all right? And this Darbu form, okay? This Darbu form is also given, is the differential of the Liouville one form, okay? And important thing is that omega is a two form. So now I have that, well, Omega is a two form, and what is this guy here? Well, this guy here stands for the contraction of a two form with a vector field, okay? You know how to do this because you, you, this is not the first cause on differential geometry that you take. And you know that when you contract a vector field with a two form, you obtain a one form. So after all, what you have here is an equation where you have a one form equal to a one form. And here, while I say play game solve equation, I'm assuming that this equation has a solution. And I'm going to find that this equation has a, a solution, and I'm going to think why this equation has a solution. The big surprise is that the solution of this equation, okay, is given by Hamilton's equations. Don't tell it anyone yet. Let's compute this. Okay, let me compute the red hand, the right hand side, okay? where I have minus the differential of H. This is extremely easy. I just need to compute partial derivative of H with respect to P, dP, all right? And minus partial derivative of H with respect to Q, dQ. There we are. We have the, the right-hand side. What about the left-hand side? Well, here I need to do a mental exercise. Well, what I don't know, the incognita here, is this vector field. But this vector field, it's a perfect vector field on the total space, on the cotangent bundle of R. So I may write this as F partial of, of P plus G partial of Q for saying F and G are C infinity functions on the total space. All right? That's what I have, okay? So now I can compute the contraction of this with omega, which is dp dq. All right, here I'm using the, no, the compact notation, okay? But you may put a sun everywhere, all right? And you get exactly, well, you get the same because formally we are going to do the same, all right? So now I need to contract this uh, one vector field with this two form, okay? So to contract this, I have done this before in the course, I, I need to, you know, to pair this two form with this vector field. So the vector field is this form, in a way, I'm speaking very childishly, and I get F dQ. And now this guy is paired with this guy. But because it's the second term and this is anti-symmetric, I have to put a minus, so I get minus G partial dP. All right, okay, so now all I have to do to solve the equation I had before is to equate this term here with this term here. So let's identify with just the coefficient, pay attention, this is a dq, the coefficient of dq, okay, the coefficient of dq is f here on the second term and on the first term, the coefficient of the Q is minus uh, partial H, partial Q. And well, and now let's equate, we have equated this guy. And now let's equate the second term. I have minus minus, I put a plus everywhere and I get this. Isn't it beautiful? All right. So what I'm saying is that this vector field that I'm going to tell you the truth, 
This vector field is called Hamiltonian vector field. This vector field that I have here, all right, I can write it, okay, as a minus partial H partial Q partial P plus partial H partial P partial Q, Q. So now, look, if I look at my differential equation before, of course, this is going to be over the trajectory. This is going to be, let me change the color. This is going to be P point, and this is going to be Q point. So I get P point minus partial H partial Q, Q point plus partial H partial P. Voila, let's compare with the equations in orange, what we call Hamilton's equations, and they are exactly the same with this change of order that you have there. Look at them, this is wonderful. We get exactly the same equations. These are Hamilton's equations, changing the order. Wonderful. So what we've learned is that if I take the double uh, summing up, that if I take the total energy of the system and I solve this equation, I get a vector field whose trajectory satisfies Hamilton's equations. This is amazing. And I've used the very important names here, Liouville, Darboux, Hamilton, so we are in a very important theory. We have these three important guys here that I'll try to find a links and uh, link them here. So this is the theory. I've already mentioned these three historical ones. Okay, so this is the motivation. And now let's think what this omega has. This omega has a, a feature. Well, first of all, observe a very interesting thing is that things happen on the cotangent bundle of Rn, and this is an even dimensional manifold. Indeed, this is what will happen in general. Any symplectic manifold will be even dimensional, and in a second you'll see why. So here, the main features are going to be, if you want, that's a constraint, but that's a constraint that comes from physics, so I think it's, so that's an important feature. These are even dimensional manifolds. The geometry is given by a two form. If I compare uh, this to, well, here this would be property zero. And if I compare this to the previous notation I used, and property is zero here. So let me draw this. Property zero here is that the dimension is any, not constraints, even or odd. And here I have a constraint is that this is even dimensional. Now, if I look at the geometry, so let me erase this thing, let me call this one. If I look, if I look at the geometry, well, this was governed by a, by anti, by a symmetric tensor, and now I'm going to take a two form, which uh, stands for the anti-symmetric version. So geometry is governed And this omega, of course, I need to impose some conditions. In the example I was working with, omega was the Darboux form, so it's the differential of the Liouville one form here. Okay, to impose that it's a differential of a Liouville one form, it's too much, but what's going to happen, so it's too much to impose that omega is exact, because if I have a compact manifold, omega cannot be exact, okay? I'll, I'll explain this after. And but what I have is that omega is closed. That's a condition I have. 
Do I have some other condition? <coughs> I need to have some other condition because I need to have this equation that I had here had a solution. So essentially, I need to impose that this that this equation always has a solution, and this condition is what I'm going to call non-degeneracy. I will give a proper definition below plus non-degenerate, so the equation has a solution. And the third condition that I will see, and this is what I will prove in my next video, is that there are no local invariants, and this is called Darboux theorem. No local invariants. And this is going to be given by the Arbu theorem. So, okay, now I'm motivated to give the following definition. Now it comes the definition. A manifold M. Well, let me do the let me be more precise. And a two form. Omega on a manifold is called symplectic if first Omega is closed. In particular, if omega is exact, this is automatically satisfied. This is the case of the root form. And secondly, omega is non-degenerate. In which sense? In the sense that an equation like Hamilton's equation, that like the equation I had before. So let me go very quickly back to this equation. I want equation of this sort to have a solution. So I want that whenever I have a one from here, I can get a vector field in a unique way. And a way to put it here is that if I have this expression, x and y equal to zero for any x and y vector fields on M, okay? If I have this, sorry, for all y, for all y vector field here, then this implies that x is equal to zero, okay? This condition, so remarks I wanna make, and I'm going to change color here, remarks. Well, the condition of non-degeneracy, I can look at this uh, in a, using, uh, I can associate a matrix to the two form, so non-degeneracy condition, Reloaded in a way. Let's use this fancy language. A different way to look at this non degeneracy is that if I express omega in local coordinates on my manifold, omega will have some expression of this, of this uh, sort. And I may uh, associate a matrix. Uh, with the coefficients, that's a matrix, all right? So, well, to say that it's non-degenerate, it's equivalent to say that this matrix, let's call it uh, A, has maximal run. 
And this is indeed equivalent to the demanding that the determinant of rate is different from zero. And if you think about this, this matrix is going to be anti-symmetric. So from linear algebra, I get that this can only happen if M, the dimension of M is even. So the fact that the dimension of M has to be even, other that it comes from the example of the Catangian bundle, it's a direct consequence of non-degeneracy and it comes from linear algebra, okay? So an important consequence, and because it's important, I'm going to change uh, the, the color here, important consequence. is that the dimension of M is even, and it comes from non-degeneracy. That's an important consequence. Another important consequence of non-degeneracy, so this is uh, the first important consequence, and the second important consequence is that, and this is, an, an, and this is something that I leave as an exercise, check that, uh, the condition of non-degeneracy, it's equivalent to omega. Omega is a two form. We agree that the dimension of n is two n. So we may wedge this n times. And this is a top form on the manifold, all right? So we require that this is a volume form. This is different from zero. So it's a volume form. Okay, this is omega n. So requiring that this is a volume form, in particular, one important consequence, important consequence of this, is that the manifolds have to be oriented. A symplectic manifold is always oriented. Okay. Well, I didn't say what is a symplectic manifold, but it's just a symbol that it's a manifold endowed with a symplectic, with it's a pair of manifold symplectic form. Okay. So this is just a pair of manifold with symplectic form. So in terms of examples, I have here as examples because uh, a symplectic form in dimension two equals a volume form, it's exactly the same. I have here as examples any two dimensional orientable surfaces, uh, all two dimensional orientable surfaces are symplectic manifolds. So here I have, for instance, any, any Riemannian manifold. I have S2, I have T2, I have all possible combinations of those. Okay, what about higher dimension? And that's an interesting question. For instance, higher dimension will be next dimension will be dimension four. Question, I'm going to finish this uh, first part of the course with a question. Is, is S2 times S2 a symplectic manifold? And second question, is S4 a symplectic manifold? All right, guys, for, for now it's enough. In my, so that's the first lesson in symplectic geometry. Second lesson, I'm going to answer these questions. I'm going to motivate why it's not enough to assume that omega is exact. I'm going to prove that if I have a compact manifold with exact form and it's not degenerate, I get a contradiction, all right? So that's the reason why I need to impose that omega is 
closed. And in the next video, I'll do this, okay? And I'll talk about classification of symplectic manifolds, local and global. I'll talk about the theorem, and I'll give the classification of symplectic subfaces. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you soon.